I don't know how many of you can see, but I got my poop socks on just to show you how prepared I am to talk about this topic today. There are spanking new guidelines released by the American College of Gastroenterology, one of the biggest GI societies, on how to manage irritable bowel syndrome, aka IBS. And we're now thinking of IBS a little bit differently now. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the latest in diagnosis and treatment so you might even be able to compare with what your doctor has done for you. Hey everyone, I'm Austin Chang. I'm a triple board certified gastroenterologist trained at Harvard and Columbia. On this channel, we only rely on evidence-based medicine, which then is used to create guidelines that we physicians follow. And I think it's really important to mention that because there might not be enough evidence out there, but it doesn't mean that we can just make stuff up. That's why these guidelines are in place. Not all recommendations are strong recommendations. Not all studies out there are strong. So these guidelines really help us synthesize everything. Let us know what are strong recommendations, where the evidence is really at, and what areas still require more study. And of course, nothing in this video should be taken as personal medical advice. Everyone has a different situation, so definitely ask your doctor if something is appropriate for you. Now, a few points of clarification first. IBS is not IBD. For anyone out there who might be confused by this, IBS is irritable bowel syndrome, whereas IBD is inflammatory bowel disease, which includes Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. IBS and IBD are two completely different entities. And not to get too much into this, but one of the key distinctions is that even though IBS can be super uncomfortable, it's not life-threatening, whereas IBD can be a life-threatening condition. Now, another thing to point out is that not all bloating or abdominal pain is IBS either. I know a lot of people who casually just throw out, oh, my IBS is acting up, but they don't truly have that diagnosis. So just because you have bloating or constipation or diarrhea or abdominal pain doesn't mean that it's necessarily IBS. Now, on that note, there are two main subtypes of IBS constipation predominant IBS or diarrhea predominant IBS. Now, not everyone fits into these categories, but if your doctor can help you figure out which one you do fall into, it might help guide treatment later on. Now, these latest guidelines that were released by the American College of Gastroenterology outlines 25 separate statement points. But I'm gonna try to summarize everything for you so that you don't get lost in the 25 different statements that they put out. Now, one of the main things that stood out to me in these new guidelines is the emphasis on a positive diagnostic strategy. Now, what this means is that we wanna make sure that your symptoms just meet several criteria and then exclude a few diagnoses and get you right on treatment as soon as possible rather than run a million different tests until we come to the diagnosis of exclusion of IBS, which is kind of the way it used to be approached. If a patient comes to us with constipation or diarrhea, we often would think like, well, let's just try to think of all the different things that could be causing this because there are a lot of different causes for constipation, diarrhea, bloating, abdominal pain, but we run a lot of different tests excluding every single condition until we run out of options and then we get to IBS. That's not the strategy anymore. And along the same lines, routine colonoscopy, food allergies, or food sensitivity tests are also not recommended before establishing a diagnosis of IBS. Of course, everyone's situation is a little bit different, so if you do truly have certain types of symptoms that are more consistent with allergies, like hives or anaphylaxis, things that are not consistent with irritable bowel syndrome, your doctor might spend more time trying to work up those diagnoses. Now, in terms of the conditions that we do want to rule out, the clinical guidelines actually do say that we want to rule out celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, like I mentioned before. This usually involves a couple blood tests for celiac disease, a stool test to rule out inflammatory bowel disease called fecal calprotectin, but even these tests aren't perfect. So if your doctor is really more suspicious about those conditions, they again may spend more time trying to work up those conditions before settling on a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. And the reason why they really want to make sure that those diagnoses are ruled out for sure is because if they're left undiagnosed, celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease might get worse and worse and cause bigger problems. Another thing that the guidelines also point out is that, again, not all constipation is due to IBS. So if your doctor really feels that there's something else going on, like pelvic floor dysfunction, where the muscles around your pelvic floor aren't functioning correctly and keeping the stool from actually exiting out of your colon, there may be other tests that have to be done to confirm that diagnosis. You may need physical therapy for your pelvic floor if you have a condition like that, but again, treatments for IBS aren't gonna work if you have a different condition altogether. The second half of the guidelines are more related to treatments. And one of the more surprising recommendations that came out of these guidelines is that peppermint is actually 
recommended to treat IBS symptoms. Now there are certain formulations of peppermint that are available over the counter, like IB Guard, that actually help deliver peppermint directly to your small bowels so they're not causing other issues in your stomach like worsening your reflux. This video is not sponsored by IB Guard and I have no relationship with that company to disclose. The guidelines also mention a bunch of different things not to use when it comes to IBS. But not that they won't work per se, um, some people might feel relief from them but there might just not be enough evidence to show that it'll work for everybody or that it'll work for all symptoms. You know, some of these guidelines actually say that some of these medications don't work for global symptoms, but it doesn't mean that they won't, don't work for specific symptoms. And just so everyone is clear, current recommendations are not to use probiotics for IBS. There's another set of guidelines entirely on probiotics out of one of the other GI societies that also doesn't recommend probiotics for IBS unless it's in a clinical trial. Again, doesn't mean that some people won't find relief from it, it just means that there's not enough evidence to show that they actually work in a consistent way. And plus, I've said this before, there are so many different formulations out there, we don't know what type of dosage is actually appropriate for the different strains of bacteria. So yeah, generally probiotics are not recommended for IBS. Some other medications that are not recommended for global IBS symptoms include antispasmodics, bile acid sequestrants. So if you're on any of those, if they're helping you, great. If not, they're not recommended by these guidelines. And surprisingly, PEG agents are also not recommended, like Miralax. And just because it might help out with your constipation, it kind of makes sense that it's not recommended for global symptoms because it's unlikely to help out with your pain, for instance. Now, some of the medications they do recommend are things that we commonly know to treat either constipation-predominant IBS, IBS-C, or diarrhea predominant IBS, IBSD. Some of these medications you probably have heard of through ads and other types of marketing um, that include chloride channel activators or guanylate cyclase activators like linaclotide or linzest, lubiprostone or ametiza, plecanide or trulance. And while those are recommended for constipation predominant IBS, other medications that are recommended in these guidelines for diarrhea, predominant IBS include Tegacerod for some patients, Alocitron, Rifaximin, Eluxadiline, or Viberzi. Again, I have no relationship to these pharmaceutical companies, but they are what are recommended in these guidelines. Now, I think we have to keep in mind that IBS can also be characterized in some ways as a sensitive gut, and the nerves that are involved in signaling to your brain to help you perceive these symptoms can actually be helped out by certain other types of medications like tricyclic antidepressants, like nortriptyline, amitriptyline, that sort of thing. And on the topic of the gut-brain connection, some patients might find relief in gut-directed psychotherapy like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is also recommended in these guidelines. Now remember, guidelines at the end of the day are guidelines. Everyone has a very specific situation to their own condition, and so these guidelines serve as a framework for your doctor to approach your situation but you know, there may be specific things that they're looking out for. At the end of the day, guidelines aren't perfect, but they are based on the best available evidence. And you know what? I went on Google and quickly searched like IBS clinics and some of these IBS clinics are recommending all sorts of things that are not evidence-based. And some of these things that I see are like a shot in the dark or some of them just don't even make any biological sense. So anyway, just make sure that the doctors that you're seeing are appropriately trained to be taking care of the conditions that you're suffering from. In the description box below, I'll link directly to the PDF of the full guidelines for you to read if you so wish. And please subscribe to me and click the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a new video if you want to learn more about gut health related stuff. But until then, please stay healthy and safe and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.